Well, I'm very pleased um, to be able to welcome Dr. Patrick McManaway to speak to us next. Uh, Patrick has been has a long history of involvement with earth mysteries and dowsing, um, as well as being a qualified medical doctor from Edinburgh University. Um, and he teaches geomancy in the UK and the US and Australia and splits his time between Britain and, uh, the UK and, and America <coughs> mainly, I believe. Um, the former uh, president of the British Society of Dowsers, um, so he knows a lot about that. And um, Patrick is very conscious of the importance of harmony, bringing harmony and vitality to the earth. Um, and to uh, nature in order to allow the abundance of nature to flourish and, and be at its best. So Patrick's going to talk to us about enchanting the fertile landscape, conversations with dragons, elementals, and nature spirits. Patrick McManaway. Oh, good morning, everybody. It is uh, truly a great, great pleasure and privilege to be standing here uh, with you all and also standing in the line of the most fantastic uh, string of speakers uh, that we've had and all congratulations to the organizers of the conference as well as the founders and keepers of the Gatekeeper Trust. Thank you all so much for the work you all do. It's, um, it's truly a pleasure to be with you today and to uh, be able to share a little bit of the, uh, the insights uh, that I've found from the work that I've been doing, particularly uh, in the context of, um, of agricultural work. Um, now, this one was working earlier and now isn't. We can do this. So the threshold that I would like to, uh, to present to you is the threshold between human and elemental, uh, between human and nature spirit, between human and landscape, and between our mind and the consciousness of our environment around us. And not only does landscape inspire us uh, to more higher and refined states of our own consciousness, but by uh, bringing our conscious awareness to match and truly meet and enter dialogue uh, with the spirits of place, the gatekeepers of place, the keepers of the elemental and nature spirit realms, uh, we can truly enter into a co-creative relationship, not only symbolic, but actual and real. And when we look back uh, into our history and prehistory, I think we find that this has always been the primary relationship, the sacred relationship that we have with landscape, mirrored as it is with our relationships with each other, um, and indeed uh, mirrored as it is with relationship with all. But particularly, I'd like to speak to um, our relationship with the spirit of place and uh, the tangible and uh, very uh, functional and simplistic uh, ways that that can benefit um, our, uh, our presence here as a collective uh, sustainably going forwards. So the sacred and fertile relationship, and I want to speak to farming as husbandry. Uh, we belong to the land, we're told by indigenous cultures in different places, and our relationship uh, as indigenous peoples, as primal cultures, uh, even as quiet gardeners in our own, um, our own backyards, really speak to a marriage uh, between people and landscape. And uh, we used to talk about farming as being husbandry, and at some point in the last 50 years it became agricultural science. And we've heard a great deal from previous speakers about uh, relationship and about the narrative and about the context uh, that we hold with the spiritual realm. And um, farming as husbandry, I want to, to suggest to you, is not, not, just a, not just an abstract philosophical, philosophical concept, but actually a very functional and uh, truly fertile relationship. So um, I mostly work um, in the context of a shamanic practitioner. I work with domestic space, with commercial and industrial space. Um, but as I say, particularly here, I want to focus on the work with agricultural space, partly because that's the closest context to that of pilgrimage um, that uh, the gatekeepers are aware of. But also, on a farm, everything is closely measured all the time. Germination rates, fertility rates, yields, um, both in plants and animals. 
And so we can very clearly see the impact and effect of our consciousness on the living system uh, that we are stewarding and participating in. And so from a shamanic perspective, when I approach a landscape, there are three uh, distinct um, processes that are required. Uh, of course, as with all relationship, with all conversation, uh, this is something that interweaves between um, each of these levels. But I want to just uh, call a distinction here because it's functionally tremendously important that when we are communicating uh, with a person or with a place, with a landscape, with a plant, with an animal, we first need to address any uh, hurts that need healed. Um, we can't have a very uh, cooperative or interesting conversation with somebody who has a hangover or who's somebody who is uh, preoccupied with an illness or a pain or a depression or something that distracts them out of the present conversation. And a great deal of our landscape is covered with hurts, as we know. We heard um, uh, Caroline and Gary speaking yesterday of the very first thing that they did before entering into the dialogue with the landscape was to respond to a call for healing. And so the healing comes first in our conversation with landscape because we want to have a conversation um, that's bright and intelligent, that's clear, that's peaceful and calm, um, and that, that is not prejudiced by the residues of uh, battlefields, of um, traumas, of uh, rape or murder or suicide or mismanagement of landscape in various ways. We need to bring the landscape first out of any residual hurt or harm that it's been carrying, uh, most of which will have been a consequence of previous human activity. Um, the two primary categories of hurt that a landscape carries, one is uh, hurt from physical activity, uh, from quarrying, from mining, perhaps from bombing. Uh, these things uh, create a direct uh, stress and shock uh, into the elemental uh, realm of consciousness, uh, a change in the pattern and the flow of the energies through dragon lines, uh, a change in the uh, qualitative nature of the elemental consciousness. The elemental consciousness is like our bones and teeth, and when they're broken, there's a very deep instinctive shock that leaves the place feeling unsettled and uh, uncomfortable, and it locks the life energy up into a state of alarm and again, no longer responsive or able to participate and cooperate fully in the life processes uh, that are happening in that place. So physical trauma in the landscape can create an elemental shock, and then emotional trauma, as, as mentioned, such as battlefield, massacre, or, uh, or local tragic events, can leave a human emotional residue that is sticky, uh, that is distressing, that colors the atmosphere, and again, compromises tremendously the capacity <clears throat> for the life forces of a place uh, to be fully available, and then secondly, to be fully engaged in what the people are doing here now. So the healing of hurt starts first. <coughs> and then secondly, and interwoven into that conversation, we need to literally have a conversation with the place about what the people are doing. And I've listed that here as a patterning of current use. Now it turns out that within the sacred relationship that we have, um, the elemental consciousness and the nature spirit consciousness is naturally inclined to support what people do. And uh, truly this is one of the most humbling aspects of my work is to discover that um, nature does not relate to us as a foreign invasive species. Uh, nature is incredibly attentive to the human mind and to the extent that it possibly can will support our wills and desires. Um, I've seen this over and over and over again, and it's such a different context, and, and this was spoken of yesterday, I think, by, uh, by Martin, that we, we, we are part of the system. We have our sacred uh, function within it, and the human mind and the human voice is part of natural processes. And so the elementals are looking to the human mind to try and perceive our intentions and to support those. Now, as I'll show you um, with slides as we go on, not every part of the human mind is directly accessible to elemental consciousness and to nature spirit consciousness. We have four octaves of our own consciousness, literally. Um, our beta, alpha, theta, and delta consciousness. And these are four octaves that are the uh, core frequencies that our brain uh, operates over. 
the beta consciousness, which is the highest of those, from approximately 30 cycles per second, 30 waves per second to 15 waves per second, is relatively imperceptible uh, to trees and plants and the DBIC community. This is tremendously important um, uh, concept. As I say, I'll, I'll show you this a little more clearly as the slides go along. So when we are in rational, cognitive, self-reflective thought, the human mind looks to an elemental rather like the shadow of a boat on the surface of the water looks like to a diver underneath. They can see that we're here, but they can't perceive our purpose. Is it a fishing boat? Is it a warship? Is it kids out partying for a picnic? Is it a gin palace? We can see that they're there, but we don't know what they're up to. Uh, trees and plants um, uh, come up into alpha consciousness, which is the consciousness that we're in when we're doing a simple repetitive task. It's that slightly daydreamy space when we're in the garden or when we're doing the dishes or often when we're driving, when the mind is consumed or uh, the, the executive part of the mind has a function to do and then the intuitive and meditative mind can come forwards. That's our alpha consciousness. Now, plants and animals come fully into that. The theta consciousness, which is an octave again below that, 15, uh, I beg your pardon, 7.5 down to uh, three and a quarter waves per second, that's where we meet elemental consciousness. Remembering that elemental and vegetational consciousness are already within us, we are composed of that in a spherical way. So we're not reaching outside of ourselves for these things, we're dropping into that part of ourselves that is that and that can communicate with that outside of ourselves. We're recognizing ourself with other. We're recognizing the sameness of inside and outside, but we need to meet it where it is. So we can have a clear communication with a companion animal, but we're not going to play chess with our Labrador. Or if you do, you may be able to easily win. <coughs> <coughs> depending on the Labrador, obviously. Um, but we can have a communication with the animal, but we need to enter into that heart-centered rapport and meet the spirit and consciousness and mind of the animal directly at its own level. And so we need to do this uh, with nature and elemental spirits. When we do this, then we can effortlessly have telepathic communication in both directions. We can express our intentions and we can receive guidance and indications and very, very specific communication as to whether they can support that, whether there's a better idea for managing uh, the situation in hand, um, more creative ways uh, that we can work with this. So this can be a very, very fertile dialogue. And um, again, as I say, not just abstract, but with massive ten tangible benefit. So most of the time when we're in landscape management, it's this second level of conversation we want to be in. Healing of hurts is the first job to do, but once that's done, then we can move on into the uh, conversation that we're having. And uh, level three, we may or may not choose to reach. That's when we introduce particular uh, uh, optimizations into a system where we can um, fine tune it, as, as it were, uh, to make it perform even more uh, optimally in one or another direction that is going to serve a human purpose, providing that we can achieve um, a consensus and an agreement from the landscape to support that practice. So what I'd like to do first is just give you um, examples of these um, functioning in, um, in real terms. So let's first go to New South Wales. Uh, to a, a sheep and um, cropping farm outside of a place called Gundawindi. And this farm had um, been very lovingly managed for many years. We're using biodynamic principles. Uh, we're using nice patterns of crop rotation. And we're using something called uh, high-density grazing, uh, which is a wonderful way of regenerating <coughs> fragile soils uh, with carefully managed animal husbandry. But in spite of that, uh, there seemed to be something holding the farm back. And um, uh, some clients like these will describe that they've got Rolls-Royce property, but no spark plugs. Something missing, something not quite working, despite their best efforts and intentions. And so I was invited to look at the farm and see if I could identify what was up and how we could shift that forward. 
And looking within a vision and with a psychic eye, I could see a very, very, very heavy cloud of sticky residue uh, left over and subsequent to an Aboriginal massacre that had happened on the site. And um, the displacement of indigenous peoples and uh, ethnocide uh, has been going on for a long time, as we know, uh, continues still today. And whatever we may feel about that from a landscape's perspective, uh, that's a very heavy residue and burden to carry, and it compromises the life force tremendously. So the first order of business, um, as many of us here will, will be familiar with and practice in our own ways, was to address these hurts. And so earthbound souls left over still in the shock and horror of the event uh, were uh, uh, blessed and uh, spirit release process to allow them to return to friends and family in the heaven realm and then to address the emotional uh, residues left over the imprint of the, uh, the shock and trauma emotionally left in the landscape as a footprint, then addressing intentional patterns of, of residue curses which indigenous and other people will leave on a landscape as a last resort uh, to assert themselves when utterly victimized. And so um, intentional and emotional uh, residues cleared and the land brought back to perhaps what we might consider an Eden-like state of virginal simplicity. Then we had the conversation about agriculture. And so the elemental consciousness in an Australian, as indeed a North American and, and landscapes uh, widely around the place, don't necessarily have the concept archetypally of agricultural management. 40,000 years, perhaps longer, of indigenous hunting and gathering and uh, looking up at this shadow of the beta mind not recognizing the plants that are being asked to be grown, not recognizing the animals that are asked to be grown, never having been lived on in a settled and permanent fashion, never having been asked to monocrop, uh, to monoculture. And so this is a whole conversation, first at a very archetypal level, and then at a very specific level with the elemental consciousness. Make sure they've got the barcode of the cattle, make sure they've got the barcode of the sheep, of the wheat, of the potatoes, understand what the people are doing in order that the life force can then be not only liberated but very finely uh, attuned to supporting those plant and animal species. So two weeks after this work had been done, uh, they planted a crop called sorghum, which is an arid tolerable grain and popular uh, therefore to, to, to grow in these marginal countries. And um, if my maths is anywhere good, uh, what happened was they yielded 44.5% higher than they had ever yielded before. 44.5% higher than they had ever yielded before. Beyond that, they were the only farm amongst 10 local farms, all served by the same agronomist, that didn't have to use pesticides because there were so many natural predators in the crop, specifically spiders and wasps, that the predatory grub, a heliothis grub, um, was simply managed in a natural and biological fashion. All of the other local farms growing the same crop had to spray for Heliothis. These guys, the system took care of itself. Quite extraordinary. Now, um, what I believe that that means, and I would say this is one of the largest uh, shifts in yield that I've ever seen, and therefore the reason that I like to share this, just to get a sense of what is possible, is that if 44.5%, let's call it um, I think that that means that one third of the growing potential of the landscape was locked up in this massacre residue. Now we have that in our cities that have been bombed. We have that in our own landscapes that have, have been um, uh, used for battlefields or, or other tragic circumstances or events. But here up to a 30% literally of the life force of the landscape had been locked up in this bad debt, as it were, in this unresolved trauma pattern. And once healed and freed and given direction and purpose, that became available um, into the agricultural process. Um, I think that this is very powerful if we consider uh, what we heard from Martin yesterday in terms of where does religion and, um, and conservation meet. Uh, you can imagine that this is worth hundreds of thousands of dollars 
hundreds of thousands of dollars. This lifts the conversation entirely out of the abstract and puts it into the very, very substantial realm of land management, simply for economic benefit, regardless of our philosophical attitude towards it. And so this is very much a gatekeeper conversation. This is a bridge between our agronomical science and our traditional uh, paganism. Pagans being farmers, the paysan. Our spirituality of fertility, our spirituality of landscape intelligence, our spirituality of life and survival. A little closer to home, up the road, outside of Minchinhampton, we have the Woeful Dane Organic Dairy Farm. And um, uh, John and Melissa are good friends, and uh, they're on the edge of the village where Julia and I live, and when I work for them, they send me home with some of their award-winning cheese. And so that's a very nice trade for um, landscape fertility in, in uh, direct uh, trade for, for their products. So um, I've, I've worked for uh, John and Melissa, as you can see here, for, um, for several years, starting in 2011. Um, the first thing that we addressed was a high mastitis rate, um, which is when the, uh, the um, an inflammation in, in the udders that compromises the quality of milk. And in the first uh, week, actually, of working for them, we were able to reduce the, uh, the mastitis rate in their herd by 65%. So an immediate response, cattle are tremendously uh, sensitive to and responsive to the quality of atmosphere in place. And again, if that's stressed and carrying residual hurts or harms, and we clean up the dragon lines and we keep clean up the elemental um, and nature spirit uh, uh, quality of consciousness on the place, immediate response. So this is a direct measurement of how stressed their cattle were. 65% in reduction in mastitis. Mastitis is the Achilles heel for cattle. So if if they're stressed, that's one of the first things that shows up. So um, very direct response in the health of the cattle. We increased their forage yield. They were tremendously excited. The next year, they ended up with a late spring drought. They were the only farm in the county to have green pastures in late May. It was very exciting. Uh, their milk fat and protein increased. Their calf mortality increased, uh, reduced, I beg your pardon. But the story that I want to focus on here is this issue uh, eliminated bloating from alfalfa forage. Now, this is where we really get into this conversation, which is the, uh, the part that I want to emphasize here. So plants have two sets of uh, metabolic substances that they create. They have what are called primary metabolites, which is what they use to create their skeleton and their chlorophyll and all the things that they need for their day-to-day -day living. And then they have a range of what are called secondary metabolites, which are the substances that they use to respond to stresses. Now, if we get stressed, we run away. Um, but if a plant gets stressed, it can't run away. It has to change its, um, its metabolic uh, profile in order to try and meet the stress. And some plants can do this extraordinarily well. There are acacia trees in Africa that giraffes have to sneak up on from downwind. <laughs> because as soon as the tree spots that it's being browsed, it releases a huge amount of very, um, uh, very extreme tannins into the leaves that make it both uh, indigestible and unpalatable. And so, downer for the giraffes, once that's happened, got to go and sneak up on the next set of trees and have a wee browse on those before they spot you're there too and again make themselves uh, unpalatable, indigestible. Uh, so plants respond to uh, dry conditions, to wet conditions, to mold, to rust, uh, to uh, pests and predators by rendering themselves impalatable and indigestible if they possibly can. Now when this happens in a grazing context with cattle, um, once indigestible material gets into the, the deeper rumens, uh, they're unable to eliminate that gas in either direction other than by uh, bloating and literally dying through an exploding stomach. Terrible death. Fatal condition. Um, very, very well recognized by, uh, by cattle, cattle people and tracked very, very closely. So what happened here in 2011, uh, John had two 
literally identical, literally parallel fields of alfalfa that he'd left uh, for last green forage at the end of the uh, season, right about now, before moving on to dry feed for the winter. Next door to each other, separated only by a, f a stone wall, planted on the same day with the same seed, by the same equipment, by the same operator. They grazed off the first field, all was well. They moved them into the second field, and immediately seven of their uh, cows came down with bloat. Fortunately, John, very attentive, spotted this was happening, took the cattle off the alfalfa, and saved their lives by drenching them with vegetable oil, which emulsifies the gas and lets it pass. But then he was looking at this large field of alfalfa, which was now no longer available to him in his uh, forage management budget uh, for the year. Terrible problem. So what do you do when you've got a field of indigestible alfalfa and cattle who are uh, suffering from a life-threatening condition? You call your dowser, right? <laughs> call your shaman. <laughs> Patrick, come and fix this up, please. <clears throat> so what's to do about this? Well, there's a conversation to have. And so um, literally uh, sat down in the field and opened my mind, and you can do this at home, and you are already doing this all over everywhere with your landscape pilgrimages. We allow the space in our imagination to be a conversational space. The imagination is the organ that we have in the psyche that allows us to communicate with unseen realms, but also with seen realms in telepathic fashion, as long as we are in that right uh, frame of mind, literally. So the conversation becomes round table. I'm sitting with the field. I want to speak to the spirit of the land. Locally, I want to speak to the spirit of farm. I want to speak to the spirit of that field, the spirit of the soils, the gnomes. Uh, the elementals um, uh, managing the space. We want to speak to the spirit of alfalfa and the alfalfa diva, spirit of the cattle, spirit of the herd, and St. Bridget, who is patron saint, amongst other things, of cattle. So we want to include all vested parties, as it were, in this conversation, and perhaps, as I did, imagine a roundtable conversation where we can literally sit down and talk this through. And so what wasn't clear to this alfalfa crop was its purpose in the farm. And it was perceiving itself to be growing wild, to have been predated upon these cattle, and to have mounted an appropriate uh, reactive response to this for its own preservation. Once everything was clear that this is a farming landscape, agriculture is happening here, the reason for the alfalfa to be planted is to be foraged for cattle, to make milk, to make cheese, uh, for people to then eat that. And so this is the conversation that happens, this co cooperative, uh, co-creative dialogue. So I had this chat, and um, you can do this too, and I'm sure many of you already do this already. I find that visual imagery uh, transfers very easily in a telepathic context. But any way that we hold <coughs> clear intention and communicate that, and then listen, because it's dialogue, it's dialogue. It's not just telling what we want. One of the fundamental principles that we need to bear in mind is that there is this elemental cooperation and there's two ways to work with them. There's either tell them what to do or invite them to participate. And I think honestly that the environmental catastrophe that we are on the edge of is because of the command of elementals. Much of our old magic will command elementals rather than dialogue and invite them. And I think that edge and threshold may literally be the edge of whether or not we survive as a species, is whether we continue to command. Because when we command, we limit the outcome to our own idea of the thing. When we're in dialogue, there is a vast range of opportunities that literally lie outside of our own imagination at that point. They're smarter than us. They've been around for several hundred million years, longer than we have. They've got the big picture. We are the small brother in this context. So we want to make sure that it is a dialogue with place. So I had this dialogue, as I described, with the vested interests concerned. And the whole thing took about three minutes flat, all right? Because telepathic communication is pretty quick. It's much, much longer of a process for me to tell you about what I did than to do it. It literally happens, telepathic communication happens at the speed of light. 
it's your thoughts. They're electromagnetic waves from your brain to the participant brain or consciousness of plant or animal or elemental. So it's, it's lightning fast, literally. So that was all good, took three minutes, had a cup of tea and went home. And the news then that follows was that after 12 hours had passed, the plants had shifted their metabolic profile and John was able to graze the whole of the rest of the field off without any further injury or incident. How about that? That blew me away. I went to bed for three days and pulled the sheets over my head and uh, reorganized my, uh, my thinking on account of that. I'd like to just uh, share a, a result that I heard of um, from a student of mine uh, that just follows this and takes it perhaps even a stage further. Um, so a lady called Juanita, who came as a student of mine um, last year, uh, is a commercial apple grower. And uh, Juanita came already as a student to me having learned how to manage weather. How many of you are able to manage weather? Everybody's hand can be up. The weather elementals are responsive to us in the same way as the earth elementals and the water elementals are. So Juanita had learned to uh, negotiate with the weather elementals to keep hail off her apple trees. And she would call on um, the Archangel Michael and Ministry of All Angels to put a hail shield over her farm whenever hail came close. And she had the experience literally of neighboring uh, orchards having their hail nets dropped to the ground by the weight of hail and no hail fell on her trees. So she had a very good, clear mind and very strong intention. This was happening already <coughs> on her farm before I met her. Um, but she took two, uh, two levels of training with me, um, three day long uh, subtle energy for farmer trainings. And then she went home to see what she could do with this. And so she starts to talk to her trees in the way that I'm describing. And she asks them how they want for fertilizer, how they want for water, how they want to be pruned, how they want to be managed. And she's really put herself into service to these trees and she's holding her imagination and her mind open to receive their guidance as to how to support their life process better. And so this is going all very well. And then she decides that she's going to raise um, an issue with them, which is to do with supermarkets. Now, supermarkets are extremely hostile members of the agricultural community because they dictate and define not only the price of product and negotiate in extremely hostile fashion, um, but also they define the shape and size that a carrot and an apple should be. And if the produce uh, coming off a farm does not conform to what the supermarket thinks the public thinks it should look like, then it's valueless and is sent away. Now with apples, that means that they have to fit in tetra packs. So your apple has to be this size by this size, otherwise it's not an apple. Now, in practical terms, what that meant for Juanita was she had to harvest entirely through her orchard three times a year so that the apples were picked at exactly supermarket specification size. So three times a year, all the way through the orchard, every tree, uh, labor costs and uh, time, and then subsequent transportation costs and storage. So she chatted to her trees about this and asked them if they could help her out. And last year, the whole orchard matured to supermarket specifications at the same moment. <laughs> How about that? And they only had to harvest once. So she dropped her labor costs by two thirds. Right, that's a big deal because our agricultural produce is grossly undervalued and any margin that a farmer can possibly get is very, very significant. So not only did Juanita have this extraordinary experience of this cooperation between her trees and herself, but also in terms of the management of the farm, um, very significant benefit. So what that means is that the trees were able to do that. Who knew that? Uh, that they were willing to do that and that they clearly heard what she asked for. So we're left in no doubt as to the capacity of the trees to respond. We're also in, left in no doubt as to their capacity, when spoken to, to hear us and to respond to us. So we really move into a very 
for me, awesome, literally, an awesome awareness of our, our place. And um, we can be sure that they're hearing something all of the time. So we want to speak always politely around plants and animals, don't we? <laughs> um, moving along, just a few more examples. This would be an example of an optimization. Uh, this is the modern example of a standing stone. It's called a biodynamic tower. And um, this is a pipe filled with uh, crushed basalt rock. And it's acting as an antenna for the Schumann resonances, which are the uh, naturally occurring uh, resonances stimulated by solar radiation that stimulate plant uh, life and allow these to penetrate into the soil structure and feed the roots. And these are used um, by biodynam biodynamic farmers and other members of, of the farming community that are interested in subtle energies. But I just want to give you a sense of what might be possible with optimizations. So this pipe here is actually serving a very small um, vegetable patch on this farm. But the hedge that we see behind it, uh, it then lets onto a cow pasture. And the cow pasture didn't have much shade, and so they got a lorry load of trees from a nursery one day, and they arbitrarily set it, uh, separated uh, the trees, all of which were identical, into two, um, uh, two batches, and they planted one here and one there. Now, the one here, as it were, turned out they planted it within the reach of influence of this pipe which by dowsing they identified to be about 450 yards. The second plot of trees was planted further away from a different part of the field and outside of the influence of this thing. Eight years passed. Um, if you see the hedge behind the head of, um, of the farmer there, that's where the pipe is, just the other side of that hedge. So these trees are, are outside of the influence of that pipe came from the same nursery on the same day and planted at the same time as these trees that are inside the influence of the pipe. Now, what do we think about that? That one looks a bit better, doesn't it? So, um, equate this with the Neolithic technology of standing stone. Instead of a solid standing stone, they'd, they'd crush the stone put it in a pipe, but they doused the location and in every way would match where we would put a standing stone if we were Neoliths. So we can see that there's, 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 a, lot, there's a lot here. There's a lot here. Fairy, fairy whispering isn't, 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 isn't wussy. Fairy whispering's for real. All right? And if you're not whispering your fairies, you're missing out on about 30% of your yield potential. So another of those pipes um, on another farm uh, not only gave a 30% uh, yield increase in the wheat crop within the range of its reach, but it also increased the quality to the premium grade, premium hard, which, believe it or not, was a more valuable outcome than the 30% yield increase. So not only yield increase, but qualitative increase of the crop itself. Now... How many of you have been involved in crocodile farming? <laughs> mm. All right. So crocodile farming, very exciting. And the most exciting uh, part about crocodile farming is the gathering of the eggs. This requires flying in a helicopter to a crocodile-infested river with an egg basket and a trowel and a rifle. And the eggs are laid on the side of the river uh, in a mound, much like turtles do. And then, of course, the crocs keep an eye on them to make sure that people like us don't come and steal the eggs, which we do with an egg basket and a trowel. And whoever wins the toss gets the rifle, and whoever loses the toss of the coin gets the egg basket. It's not enough just to dig and grab the egg and run. It's got a little air pocket at the top that has to stay at the top, otherwise the embryo loses viability. So you have to carry the egg very carefully, uh, moving quickly back to your helicopter and um, fly off before... Um, catastrophic detection occurs. What this means is that the eggs are very, very valuable. Very, very valuable. And so... Um, uh, 
So the egg, eggs are valuable and the hatching rate is absolutely critical to the viability of a farm such as this. And so the manager of this farm, uh, after taking similar trainings uh, to Juanita and our discussions of what, what might be good and what might be possible, uh, went back to the farm and decided, decided to use sound. Now, how many of you sing in the landscape? Yeah, everybody sings in the landscape. We're going to get songsters of our landscape coming up after lunch, I believe. Um, everybody knows that if you sing to your cows, you get a better milk yield. But they don't teach that anymore because that's old folkloric tradition and certainly not part of agricultural science. But everybody knows it, and it's been well proven that sound uh, and particular resonances and frequencies are stimulating to living systems. So um, Mark decided to try this with his crocodile eggs. He got an iPod and speakers and uh, healing and life-stimulating recordings of Tibetan gongs and bowls and horns and started playing these classic uh, traditional uh, landscape stimulation sounds. Could have been the human voice, would have worked nicely. Could have been a didgeridoo, would have worked nicely. Uh, the human voice, with or without embellishment, uh, will stimulate living systems. Um, Mark had recordings that were preset for human health. Um, as I say, Tibetan gongs and bowls and, and horns, so he used those. Now what happened was his survival rate of his eggs went from 70% to 87% simply by singing to them. As you can see, this was worth $1.7 million per year to his farming operation. Is that um, Australian dollars? Those were Australian dollars. They were indeed. So, would you sing if it was worth $1.7 million to you? <laughs> to be honest and fair, you would need to back out the cost of the iPod and speakers um, <laughs> before uh, running this past your accountant. Uh, but I think it leaves us in no doubt um, that that is useful. And um, why they don't teach this in agricultural college, I don't know. Maybe there's too little money in it. So, let me just do a time check. I get to go till 12? Uh, till 12.45. 12.45. <coughs> um, So these subtle energies, as we said, these are present within and around us. Although they're beyond our five sense perception, these are, we're talking about the frequencies of brain, frequencies of heart, uh, communication frequencies. And um, our thoughts and feelings affect living systems depending on the quality and character of our thoughts and feelings and the sensitivity of the system to them. We have traditional names, for our animating life force, it's our ether, our chi, our prana. If we're Kalahari bush people, it's our noom, and so forth. But I would assert that these are in no way different from the energies that are studied. Chi is not different from electromagnetism. These are simply the words that our contemporary science is allowed to use for the energy of living systems. Electricity, magnetism, gravity, weak and strong nuclear forces. So we're all talking about the same stuff. So it doesn't matter if your dragon is a dragon or if it's a telluric current or if what you're looking at is bioelectromagnetism or chi. It's all the same stuff. So what that means is that we can draw information guiding principles both from traditional and contemporary sources. We have wonderful insights now with our modern science, but we don't have much wisdom in our traditional science because it's not being applied in this way. What we have from traditional sources is a vast thousands of years, six and a half thousand years <coughs> of sustainable agriculture, vast repository of traditional wisdom as to how to work with life forces. And so we want to draw from these both and realize that everybody has been talking about the same thing all along. So human love is our rocket fuel and is the most important thing that we can possibly bring to bear in any situation into any system. And simply that alone, sprouting seeds on a kitchen table, um, love one tray, love the water you put into one tray, ignore the other, 
um, just give it tap water without a blessing, you'll see about a 30% yield increase in 10 days. Once you've done that, everybody in the family gets their own tray of seeds and then ruthless competition can break out. <laughs> Who can bless best? <laughs> this is good training for the child mind as well as the adult mind. Um, we want to be very, very clear that unconditional love confers a blessing. Unconditional love energizes and supports the truth and beauty of the natural state of the soul of the thing. Unconditional love. That's what a blessing is, I believe, I would assert. Secondary to that, and after we've established the rapport and energized the system with simple love, then we can add specific intention of need and desire, whatever that may be, for the alfalfa to be able to be digested by the cattle uh, or for the apple crop to come to harvest uh, at one time for the convenience of the supermarket. So we can add intention in secondarily, and intention is important uh, because it allows us to share purpose and to cooperate. But again, the true blessing is uh, unconditional love, and that's where we want to start. And then beyond that, we have a wide range of things that we can use. Sound I put at the top of them because um, we carry our voice with us. But we can work with terrestrial magnetism and Schumann resonances is what's happening with the standing stone or the pipe, with biodynamic preparations, with classical homeopathy, with radionics, and any other system um, that we are in relationship with. Now let me just do a very quick run past here because science and magic are one study. And they're only divided by the ignorance and misunderstandings of different language frameworks. This is a toroidal field. Has anybody ever successfully blown a smoke ring? All right. So why was that fascinating and why was that cool? The smoke ring is a toroidal field. And it exists while it has a rotational symmetry. Once it loses rotational symmetry, it dissolves and disperses into a cloud of amorphous gas. For as long as this rotates, this retains its symmetry and it retains its identity and it retains its ability to hold one location in time and space. So if you want your consciousness and indeed if you want physical matter to hold its point in time and space, it needs to have a rotating symmetrical toroidal field. This is the only self-sustaining field form in the universe, as far as we know it. The only self-sustaining field form in the universe as we know it. That means if you're not one of those, you're a dispersed cloud of gas. <laughs> now, we're made in the image of God. We're told this clearly. What that means is that is the image of God. And that is also the image of us and of the atom, and of the wheat stalk, and of the cow, and of the planet. We are all this. Because we are all this, we are literally in a common brother and sisterhood of beings. What applies to us applies to what is outside us at any scale of fractality. We literally are all one of these. It's very simple. Here we have the bar magnet. What we're looking at is the flux in toroidal form. The same is true for our planet. The same is true for us. The heart is generating our toroidal field, the space within which we live. Man as walnut, man as apple. So we are all one of these. And inside of this space is where the resonance of our consciousness exists. The Earth's consciousness is held within this and is greatly stimulated by the patter of the solar wind, um, which establishes the resonances of life that then surround us and support us. And the loudest and strongest of those resonances is the so-called Schumann resonance at 7.83 waves per second, which is the exact midpoint of the four octaves that our brain works over. So our thoughts and feelings are literally... Um, at the same level of frequency as the planetary consciousness. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Who's thinking who? Who's thinking who? 
Um, the wave becomes a circle, the circle becomes a wave, so we were able to generate in our circular space waves that we then transmit, and uh, waves coming in we can hold and capture around our center of consciousness, and like a radio set, amplify whichever frequencies of consciousness are of desire to us. We cannot switch this off. All we can do is learn to uh, manage this carefully. Uh, Peter was speaking very eloquently about our vertical axis of consciousness um, is literally an axis of resonance like a guitar neck. And here is our divine monochord with the elemental uh, frequencies of earth and water, air and fire, the elemental realm down at the bottom there. Uh, next, the uh, resonances of the human experience, um, the emotions and thoughts, moon and mercury, and uh, the inner planetary consciousness is up to the solar, and then above that, angelic, above that, archangelic, and then beyond that, frequencies that we cannot directly perceive. But a holistic diagram, and remembering that this, although it seems to be a hierarchical line, is in fact uh, only a line from the center to the edge of a circle. We live in a concentric spherical universe, and any line that we draw is only a radius. <clears throat> More of that another time. So we have these ex this experience then uh, equating with different levels of our consciousness. And the point of mentioning this is, again, we are meeting this outside of ourselves. We're meeting, we have our inner elemental consciousness, we're meeting the outer elemental consciousness. Inner mind meets outer mind. Um, so consciousness is a function of frequency and waveform. Here are these four um, uh, frequency sets that we're working over, the beta, alpha, theta, and delta. As they say, plants come up into alpha, and elementals come into theta. So we just have to meet them at their own level. So frequency defines what we access, and then the shape of the wave defines the quality of its content. And you can see the golden ratio there <coughs> defines the waveform of love uh, measured by um, spectrum analysis from both heart and brain waves as people enter into a grace state from which we are then able to um, uh, communicate between species and achieve psychokinetic effects of various kinds. I'd like to just move on here, though, to speaking about elemental consciousness and that relating to water particularly. And we'll move a little quickly. I'm guessing that most of you are familiar with these pictures. And if not, I want to just speak to this quickly. The photo on the left is of an ice crystal frozen from severely polluted water the photo on the right is the same water refrozen after having been blessed. Now, that is totally a demonstration of the effect of the quality of our consciousness. I want to point out that gratitude is the lowest rung on the ladder for the human mind to re-achieve its natural state of grace. Look how simple the coherence of gratitude is compared, for example, um, with the fractality that arises from compassion. So there are different degrees of coherence here, um, but gratitude will reliably get us to where we need to be. Now, I want to just, but while I've got another five minutes here, tell you stories about direct communication with the elemental realm, of which water is one of the most easily uh, observable because it's present with us, it's very dynamic, and we have a long tradition of blessing our rivers and springs. Now, um, when we bless water, it changes its, um, its coherent uh, pattern, as we saw. And this improves its ability to nourish plants, uh, to nourish animals, and has its own direct effect. But um, when we do this in, in large context, uh, we can get extraordinary benefit. So here we are, we're in, um, uh, we're in Australia again, and we're blessing a borehole. And we bless this farm borehole, and it's feeding a farm that has 120 different paddocks, half of which have water in the trough uh, from this borehole, from this well, the other half of which 
the water source is a, a shallow pond. And so on a field day, 30 Australian farmers and I, we start by blessing the mycorrhizal fungi in one of their fields that has a low biological assay. Subsequently, the mycorrhizal fungi assay went off the chart. It was so high. So the mycorrhizal fungi responded to a good blessing. And then we blessed the borehole. And we did before and after tasting, and it was way better tasting after we blessed it, we thought. And then we went away. And then two weeks later, I get feedback from the farmer there. And he says, Patrick, I've never seen, I've never seen this happen before. The sheep are doing something very strange. And he said, now with 120 paddocks in this semi-arid condition, what they do is they move the sheep literally every day. So they don't overgraze, and they give the paddocks a three-month rest period before coming back to it. And he said, since we blessed that well, any time I open the paddock to let the sheep out of a field that they'd been watering off, off of a pond uh, and give them access to a trough with the blessed water, the whole <coughs> herd will gallop up to 1.2 kilometers to the trough. <laughs> All right. This, this, is, this is now an official test of how well you can bless water oh, no. is whether you can get sheep up over 15 kilometers per hour in moving towards it. So this behavior continued for six months until I got back to the farm, at which point we extended our work and we blessed all of the ponds and instantly the behavior stopped and they were back to being equally happy uh, either with dam uh, trough water or pond water. You just can't do placebo on a sheep. <laughs> now, but I want to extend this because we can, we can explain that in terms of the pictures that we saw of Dr. Emoto's. But water will do more than this. Water is not only amenable to our blessing, but it's also cooperative. And the first uh, experience that I had of this, and I've had a number now, was of in a drought in Vermont 15 years ago going to a friend's house uh, by invitation because her three-foot deep shallow well in the woods behind her house that had been feeding it nicely for all of the time she'd lived there, 20 years, had gone dry. And what could we do about this? And so it was clear to me that the spirit of the spring was still there, although the water was not. And so telepathic communication with the spirit of spring. Was it possible for it to regenerate itself? Answer was yes. Was it willing to regenerate itself? The answer was yes. Did it need anything from us? The answer was yes. What did it want? Who can guess what it wanted? It wanted song. It wanted song. And so we sang to it. We just made up our special song. And within 48 hours, in the absence of rain, it was full of water. And then I did the same again on a second dry spring. And same process. Spirit of the spring was still strong. Water wasn't there. Could it regenerate itself? Yes. Would it? Yes. What did it want from us? Song again. Sang to it, 48 hours, full of water, no rain. Then I was working a completely different job, doing ghosts and geopathic stress for a third client. And she decided, uh, after I'd been there for a couple of hours and we were having a cup of tea, that she'd trust me with an intimate secret. She said... Do you know what? My spring went dry. And I sang to it, and it came back to life. <laughs> so, all of a sudden we start to think differently about our rituals of well dressing and our pilgrimages to holy wells, and that it might not actually simply be for us to feel better about doing it as sacred purpose, but actually that it's a reaffirmation of a very fundamental and sacred relationship that we have with landscape. Now, this is a dry creek bed in New South Wales. I'm sharing these. The, the, the farming conditions in Australia are very marginal. And so um, you, you, you get very dramatic benefits sometimes uh, from relatively small input. So on this farm, we had a healing job to do that was to do with, again, releasing um, residual uh, energies from Aboriginal <coughs> displacement. And the Aboriginal people uh, in a dry landscape traveled along and camped next to the creeks as water sources. 
And so we weren't, in fact, specifically working on water here, but we were very, very specifically working on the energies around the creeks um, to heal them, to bless them, to bring the landscape back to life overall. And so this creek has been dry for eight years. And again, uh, after two weeks, I get an email uh, from the client. She says, I don't know what you did, but there hasn't been any rain. And the creek's full of water now, but not on the neighbor's property. <laughs> Only on their property had the water come back into the creek. I'm assuming that in a physical level, um, what we've got here is a gravel base that the water is down in. Because if it's not flowing on the neighbors, I don't know where it came from. So I'm guessing that the subterranean flow and that the healing and loving and blessing of this place um, brought this relationship with water back and the water offers itself um, to the farming operation and, uh, and brought itself back up, as you can see here, um, to beautiful life. Let your mind run around the planet and wonder about that. Mm. And I think that my time is up, and I'll leave you with that thought. Patrick, thank you so much. Uh, isn't that mind-blowing? Yeah. Uh, just is amazing.